for you to be inside at the Big White Tent to uh, hear from some of our most extraordinary artists here, um, which are our fine art photographers. And one thing I would say about each of these wonderful panelists today, I mean, all of our artists have this heart, but there's something very um, specific about this group that they have such passion and heart for what they're doing. Um, I think you're really going to be inspired by what they have to share. We're going to learn a little bit about how they do what they do and why they do what they do and all that good stuff. So um, again, my name is Susan. My husband and Jake and I are the owners, promoters of the Celebration of Fine Art along with our magnificent team of people that help make it happen every year. And today's panelist from your left to right, uh, Light Hunter Vitali. Welcome. And Bill Pack. Welcome, welcome. Both Arizona residents, right? And then Kath Carolyn Thome, all the way from Maryland. She's with us again this year. And John Linton, also an Arizona native. Native? No. Mostly. Mostly, but an Arizonan down in uh, Bisbee. Yeah. So um, we've had a lot, years of experience here of all these photographers. And um, the topic was called Life Through the Lens. I think, something like that. So we're gonna get a peek into their inspiration and I promise that we're gonna make sure they all talk directly into the microphone so you can hear. If you have a problem, just say closer. That's our tip to hold the microphone closer. So we're gonna do our best. So um, I'd like to start by having each panelist tell us a little bit, of, you know, say your name, how long you've been doing what you're doing and one thing you absolutely love about photography, starting with you. Hello. Uh, first, let me uh, apologize that being a photographer, I think we use the excuse of not being a verbal communicator because we use photography to express ourselves. So uh, I'll start with that. Uh, my name is Light Hunter. That's my reborn name. My birth name is Vitaly. And uh, I don't even know if I consider myself a photographer. I consider myself an explorer. I I consider myself uh, somebody who's very passionate about nature and the spirit of nature. Uh, to me, that's what motivates me and inspires me. I just found photography to be uh, a way to communicate and uh, express myself. Um, I started in photography uh, more as a tool to heal and uh, use it as a form of, of uh, really grieving was when I started as a teenager. And uh, I really feel uh, very grateful for photography, for nature. I feel like it saved my life. Uh, it sounds very extreme, but um, I think uh, being on the adventure looking for light and uh, that hunt has gave me purpose. And uh, it's been a journey. Uh, I've been doing it for 40 years. Um, I've been reminded uh, several times throughout this show how long I've been doing this and uh, sometimes it's kind of awkward because this is my camera, this is what I actually use, it's a film camera and people usually go, oh, that's an old-fashioned camera. So I guess I'm an old-fashioned kind of photographer and uh, I still use film for everything I do and uh, I haven't figured out how to make a phone call with that yet, but you know, it, it'll, it may happen, you never know. But I just, uh, I love film. I love the look of film. People, people ask me all the time, why aren't you using digital? You know, come, come to the age of today. And, and it's really hard to answer because I think each of us have, uh, you know, a different approach about how we do it. I think, you know, these fine photographers here uh, you know, I know they use digital and they're very great at what they do. And why I choose to use film is I like to slow down. I like to spend time with my subject, get to know it, uh, and I feel like film really forces you to do that. You can't just blast through a bunch of images. Um, not that you have to do that with digital, but I think it's just very easy to do. Um, I do have an iPhone. I use the iPhone for photography as well. Um, and I do blast through photographs, but using this camera, um, it's very methodical, it forces you to slow down. There's nothing about it that uh, requires, uh, 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 what's what say? There's no, nothing automatic, nothing automatic about it. it doesn't, the 
decide your exposures, doesn't uh, pick your focus, doesn't um, pick your composition. You have to make all those decisions, and I like that. I like I like to slow down, and sometimes I can be in a spot for two weeks, waiting for four seconds of light. That's why I do what I do. I like to bond with my places that I go to and explore, and I enjoy that process. So I slow down, and I think, I think that's been the best gift that I've received because I got to bond with my subject. All right, that's awesome. I'm sure we'll, I'm going to extract a little bit more out of you later on the healing aspect and, and some of the places you've been that you've, you've waited out for the light. So, but thank you for the great introduction. And then right next to you we have Bill, Bill Pack. Tell us a little bit about you and, and why this subject matter which you chose. I've been in photography for about 40 years as well and uh, started out with film and I love the process of film as well. Uh, it does cause you to slow down and you have to think through your compositions and there is a process that goes with it. And I do use digital now, but I still go through the same process as I did when I was doing film. Everything's on a tripod, I go through my compositions, I work on my lighting. Um, I bring my light with me so I don't have to wait for two weeks. But, uh, <laughs> um, and I have a, a, this, so I did advertising for about 25, 30 years. And I did light painting, which is my lighting process, with my advertising on film. And that took about 30 minutes to, or more per sheet of film to do, and it was 8x10 film at the time. Um, now I'm working with, uh, with digital, and I'm still working with painting with light, but I've changed the subject matter. Before I was doing a lot of product, product photography, a lot of food, and um, I took about a year to figure out what subject I really wanted to immerse myself in. And I kept looking at this era of cars behind me. There's just something beautiful about those cars. There's just, uh, they were hand-drawn as the designers were working on it. They were putting their, you know, their emotions into the piece. And then those emotions got pounded out into metal. And so now I get to spend a day with each of the cars in the dark, and I take my lighting, which I spin about, I knew I wanted to do the process called painting with light, but to expand that to, to cars took some testing. Spent about a year going through that, trying to figure out how I could control the light, how I could uh, get it so I could just find those lines of the designers, so I could find those emotions in there, but yet bring my sense and eye to it so that um, my sensibilities would, would show up as well. Uh, I found out later in life that I was dyslexic and, and that explained a lot of things for me. Writing was difficult, other things were difficult. But then when I discovered photography in high school, it was kind of like, the world opened up to me, so that was a way that I could express myself and express my emotions. And right now, these cars are just captivating my attention, so that I can. So there's kind of a quiet serenity in my work a lot of times. But as soon as you light one of these cars up, because they're all race cars, there's a whole whole lot of violence underneath there, underneath the serenity. So there's kind of a lot of parallels in life where things can be kind of serene on the surface, but there's a whole lot going on underneath. That's awesome. And I'm going to have you expand a little bit more later on your painting with light so that people understand that. But I love that. And I love that analogy right there at the end. It's like it's my swan analogy. Make it look elegant on top while you're pedaling down below. So um, Carolyn, let's hear a little bit from you. Okay, my name's Carolyn Thome, and uh, I've been doing this kind of photography for about eight years. Uh, on my 50th birthday, my husband built out the space above his studio, his shop, and said, this is all yours, uh, do whatever you want. And so I chose, I mean, I've been doing photography all my life, but to, 
to have, sorry, to have a um, to have a dedicated space where I could do studio photography was just enormous, and um, you know I didn't have to clean it up after I was done. I could just leave it all there. So that coincided with um, uh, being shown how to find morels out in nature, and I had a friend who was a big mushroom hunter. And he took me out to go find morels and um, swore I would never go back to wherever he brought me, which I still don't remember to the day where it was. And um, somewhere in Virginia. And, um, and so um, I uh, went out to go find morels. And this is a long story, but I went to go find morels. And they're really hard to find. So, um, that's, why so that's why they're so expensive. And, and they, uh, so I was finding all these other incredible mushrooms, and um, and I was like, wow, I have this studio space that I can just bring home mushrooms. So when I was driving home from my day job, I would stop and go for hikes in the woods, and then bring like an arm full of mushrooms home to photograph in the studio. You know, and I'd stay up to 11 o'clock at night doing that, and then uh, then go back to my regular job during the day. And so, just having that, um, I've been a photographer all my life, since like I was 10. I've gone through all the, you know, cheesy cameras that we've all gone through in our lives. Started with film, like everybody here probably did. And, um, and that, starting with film really helps you have a keen eye on what you're looking at, and framing, and exposure, and all that, so you stop and slow down and really try to figure out uh, your subject. So anyway, that's kind of what it's led me to. So. The beginnings, okay. And by the way, her her previous day job was fairly impressive too. You wanna to say what that was? Yeah, my previous job, I was at the Smithsonian for 31 years. I was a, um, a model maker and a photographer there. So you will notice uh, in my work, you'll see Definitely, I've been influenced by the Smithsonian and their, mostly their Natural History Museum. Awesome, awesome, thank you. All right, Mr. Linton, tell us about you. I'll do my best. Uh, my name's John Linton. There we go. My name is John Linton and I'm, I was told I shouldn't suggest this, but I'll suggest it anyway. I'm an accidental photographer. I think if, um, if you live long enough, you know, you end up usually doing a few different things, like the Smithsonian and then you, and now Carol is doing this and has been for the last eight years. Um, my career started in fashion with Ralph Lauren, and I worked uh, pretty closely with Mr. Lauren for a number of years, right here in Arizona, uh, traveling between here and Arizona and New York. Uh, I transitioned from that into the art world. And I met Susan that way many, many, many years ago. I had a magazine here in Arizona called Art Book. And I wandered into that when one of the fellows that I worked with at Ralph Lauren said that he was getting out of the rag business and that he was opening up some galleries in Old Town. And he knew that I was getting burned out from the time on the road with Ralph Lauren. And he said, you should start an art magazine in Arizona. And I said, I don't know anything about art. And he said, sweetheart, you've worked with Ralph Lauren for a number of years, everything is art. <laughs> so, um, And you it know, was a great publication. Yeah, thank you, it, it, was, it was nice. It, you know, my soul was in it, but I'm a soulful guy and everything that I do is a soulful expression. Um, you know, and when you're young, no doesn't seem to be a possibility. When, when, you get a little older, you realize that no is a reality. Uh, but being full of a lot of youthful naivete, I just went from gallery to gallery and said, I'm starting a, an art magazine, would you participate? And I couldn't believe the number of people that said yes. And I did that for a, a number of years. Um, I wandered into photography, and like Carolyn had mentioned, we've most of us have been using cameras. I, I played with my mom's camera as a kid and used it so much it broke. Uh, I've used a Polaroid camera. 
Uh, you know, so most of us, when you get to be our age, you know, film was a thing. I am today using the machinery or the tools of our time, which is digital photography. Um, I, my segue into photography was not, you know, it's, it wasn't easy. I started taking pictures out on the street. So what you're seeing behind you, this is a byproduct of photographs that were essentially not my central focus initially. Uh, I had a friend, uh, I have a friend here uh, that knew this man, and I started taking photographs of people in the street after uh, people that were living in the margins, people who were unhoused, unhoused. Unhoused. I started taking photographs on the street as a way to pay honor to a friend's memory that lost his life to eviction. And by the way, we measure success. Um, this friend of ours had a lot of success, and, but addiction doesn't have a bias against socioeconomic status. So I thought I'd pick up a camera and use art as an instrument to pay honor to his memory and at the same time give a voice to people that were living in the margins. I thought I'd have a single exhibition and that would be it. And boy, was I wrong. One photograph on the street turned into a whole different career for me. Um, I started taking pictures in quiet places like the Grand Canyon behind me simply as a way to reconstitute what taking pictures on the street was doing to my soul, which was essentially uh, I'd wear the clothes of despondency of those that were living without shelter. I'd live with those. I'd wear their clothes home like they were my own. And I'd have to find refuge in quiet places uh, to reconstitute what that was doing. Um, I had the courage. I think at one point I went to a show in Santa Fe uh, and I was plan planning on doing a book for a, a, a photographer in New Mexico and there was a two-man show. And I had the courage to have a conversation with this master photographer in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and show him a few photographs. I told him that I, I had fussed around with the camera, and I said I have an exhibition of photography of, uh, on the street that's traveled around the western part of the US, and he said, uh, well, let's see what you have. And I showed him a photograph of some wild Mustangs that I'd taken in Monument Valley, and he said a few things. He said, go back to Scottsdale, print that, and you can come back to my studio and take anything you want. Secondly, don't tell people that you're an accidental photographer or that you fuss around with a camera. You're a photographer. And thirdly, start showing your work. And then I came in and had the courage to show Susan, and I think you had said, I didn't know you were doing this. Uh, and Susan's been kind enough to give me a home here for seven years now. We had done the book together for our 25th anniversary book, if anybody remembers that. that John was the one that helped produce that book with me, where each of the artists had their artist statement, art is, art is statement, and we matched it with a photograph. So, yeah, so we had that, and then he showed me his beautiful work, and do you see what I mean about they're all, soulful is really the right word. I mean, each, each one of these human beings here, the, it's not about the work, it's about the, the, the work that the work does for them, and the gift that it gives to all of us, the viewer, and, you know, really, really important. Uh, I think I'll end there. All right, well, there's more. There's more. Okay, yay. So, so good. Um, I could do an hour interview with each one of you individually, so this is going to be hard, but um, you each, I think, have expressed to us how the work has helped you become free of whatever uh, demons or challenges there might be, and and again, John, I know you, he, he actually had a whole um, display of the previous work called I Have a Name Project, and it was uh, images of the people he'd met on the street, and he gave them a, an opportunity to have a name. And then, again, this, this soulful uh, reconstitution, he would have to go and, and get filled up. So, um, and Lighthunter, you talked about that, that it, it saved your life 
going out exploring, and I love that you use that word because you really do explore, and you can take us places that many of us will never go. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about like how that, how that felt, filled your soul back up after, you know, obviously there was something that had it depleted? Wow, that's, that's a big one. <laughs> and I'll try to keep it short. Um, when I was a teenager, my mother uh, passed away from cancer. And when you're a teenager, you don't really know how to deal with that grief. And it's, it's interesting because even though I'm a lot older today, I still have pain. And we all cope with things differently, but I think when you're a teenager, you don't know how to cope. And when I was a teenager, when my mom was uh, passing away from cancer, I looked at beautiful scenery. I looked at postcards, and it helped me escape. You know, I would just sit there in bed and just look at these beautiful photographs of Arizona and the Southwest. And I still have those postcards today, and I cherish them because the memories for me it was like an escape. When I look at those photographs, it gives me peace and it gives me solace. And uh, these are photographers that photographed the Southwest uh, well before us, like. Uh, Joseph Munch, Dick Dietrich, Ray Manley, Bob Bradshaw, uh, these wonderful photographers. And uh, I would just escape by looking at those photographs. And when my mother passed away, we didn't deal with grief. Um, my brothers, we just all, we cried the day she passed away. And we never, we never talked about it. Um, and being a photographer, we don't communicate much. I'm going to admit that. Um, so we just stuffed it in. And uh, my brothers uh, dealt with their grief differently. Uh, my older brother went to, to uh, numb himself with uh, um, addiction. And, uh, you know, just like John was saying, you know, his heart uh, feels for people out on the streets. And these are people that, you know, that are going through, you know, uh, some things in their life that they're having a hard time coping with. And uh, I could have been that person very easily. Uh, I have another brother that, uh, you know, kind of got distracted with other kinds of things he shouldn't have been doing. And my father didn't talk about grieving either. Um, it's kind of funny, but he really chased skirts. That's kind of what he did. He was chasing women. He was a ladies' man. Um, and I went to nature. That's what I did. I, I, uh, as soon as I hit 18, I just kind of hit a spot in my life that it came to the surface uh, that uh, I was really grieving and I needed to get to nature. That was the only thing that felt like I had a chance to survive was going out to these beautiful places, Grand Canyon, uh, Sedona, Arizona is just full of so many beautiful places. And uh, I drove off to Page, Arizona. And, uh, I found a thing called the Slot Canyon, and I know many people now know what a Slot Canyon is, but back then, that was in the early 80s, uh, there was very few people have ever experienced a Slot Canyon. And I discovered one, and it was like a, a cathedral. It was, you know, I wasn't raised on a religion, but when I walked into one of those uh, canyons, it was really like uh, being in a womb of Mother Earth and creation, and... Uh, it felt like my sanctuary, and I would just spend every day down there, and I'm not exaggerating. I wanted to see every, every day, every time of the day, every, you know, throughout the year, and light being subject and something I'm really drawn to, it changes throughout, you know, the, the times of the day and the times of the year, and uh, I just couldn't leave. In fact, when I would climb out of those canyons, I would hit reality. I would crawl out of a crevice of 150 feet down in the earth and reality would hit me and I'm like, I think I like it down here better. <laughs> and I would do it back down in and just enjoy its uh, uh, visual splendor of light and shadow and just being so intrigued by that, it really saved my life. I know, I, I know it sounds very dramatic, but that's really how I got into photography. Uh, I'm really not passionate about photography. Photography to me is just a technique to express myself. But what I'm really passionate about 
this nature and the spirit of nature and that relationship. And that's when that relationship started to begin with me, was being in those places of solitude and silence. And I think we all know that wilderness itself and the experience we have of the wilderness and, and freedom and, and that solitude and silence, that's becoming really hard to achieve nowadays. Um, we don't have that as much anymore. So uh, back then I really had those opportunities to be down in these canyons and, and experience that. And uh, so really that was the beginning of what shaped uh, my healing journey. And the natives, I didn't talk about that, but the Native Americans is, uh, are people that I started building a relationship with by being down in these canyons. And they would check up on me um, quite often. And I, I think in their minds, they were wondering what this kid was doing down in these canyons, 150 feet down and using ropes to get down in these canyons. And why was he down there? And, um, you know, and I explained to them, you know, that I just, uh, love the beauty and, and, and the power of these places, but still they were questioning, you know, why, why was I there and, and I'm on their land and what am I doing down there? And I started developing relationships with the Native Americans, the Navajo, and uh, one particular family is the Young family that uh, has the grazing rights of a very famous Lock Canyon now. And uh, at the time, the gentleman that has grazing rights uh, used to work at the Navajo generating plant and uh, he would see my Bronco up on the top of the canyon and I'd be down there using my ropes and, and just spending all day down there. And he would yell down the, the canyon from the top and it's just this two foot slit and it's 150 feet down and he would yell down there and say, hey, you know, are you okay? And I would just hear his voice reflecting in the canyon and you know, I'd get kind of startled for a minute because I was just in awe of beauty and, and watching light all day. And, and uh, I would hear his voice up there, I knew who it was, and I'd yell back up and say, yeah, I'm okay. And I was just marveling at creation again, and you know, he'd check up with me again, and he'd say, what are you doing? And he'd really curious. I'd yell back up, and I'd say, waiting for light, because that's really what I would do, is just wait for light. We bonded, we, we developed a relationship, and. He really took me in, and I, and I want to share that for a minute, because the Navajo are people that are very uh, non-judgmental, and they're very loving people, and once you build a trust with them, they'll, they'll wrap your arms around you. They're just incredibly loving human beings, and, and, uh, and that's exactly what they did for me as a kid. They just wrapped their arms around me, and, you know, and... And I, most of the times, uh, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know what they were communicating with me because they were speaking in Navajo and they would do prayers for me and I was slapped with eagle feathers and water splashing and, you know, this is part of their prayers and their ceremony and I really didn't know what they were saying, but what I could feel is their love and to me that's universal and it just really helped me uh, begin my healing journey and made me realize that, you know, these are really loving people and we just really bonded and, and, and connected and and uh, that was kind of the birthing of how these slot canyons started to get a lot of exposure and I know that's not that long ago um, but that's really kind of the beginning of some of these canyons that become well known and uh, and that's where the beginning of my rebirth uh, happened and, and my reborn name of Light Hunter came about and I stick to that name because I am Light Hunter. I love hunting for light. I love that spiritual connection with light. And I don't want to be removed from that. That to me is healing. And that's my purpose, is to share that beauty. So I'll just. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And at what point did you know you needed to share these images that you were finding with the rest of us? Well, I think, you know, that's part of what I feel like saved my life is I, I, it did give me purpose. It gave me a purpose to share the beauty and the spirit of nature. And I always say to people that I really don't want you to just see my photographs. What gives me satisfaction is to know that you can feel something from it because it really is the spirit of nature. It's not tangible. It's not something that we necessarily see but we can feel within. And I think that's love. So that's really what I'm looking for when I make an image, is what speaks to me here, and hopefully that can communicate through the image. I think you've mastered that. Yeah. 
or you rat I, we're always mastering we're never completely done but you're you're doing a great job thank you thank you all right um there's more in there too but um bill you you mentioned that you use the technique of using light to paint and it, you really need to describe that a little bit because it takes a minute to understand how you move that light to get those images that really makes feel like the car is moving and uh you know again i like your analogy about why the race cars but go for it with the well with uh light painting my i'm in a completely dark room and my camera's on a tripod and my lens is open from anywhere from 30 seconds to about uh, 15 minutes depending on the exposure and on these cars here the camera is out where you are located and I'm on the other side of the car with lights and while the lens is open I'll take it and pass over the car and I'll paint in the, the lines that I want you to see and I'm able to control the highlights and the shadows and try and get that chiaroscuro kind of effect where it's light and dark. And the wonderful thing about light in general is as I'm taking it across a car, it will reveal something else that I hadn't seen before because it was either out just in full broad daylight or in darkness. But as I go across, it's like the edge light reveals something else to me. And so when I finish the one image, I'll have seen something out of the corner of my eye and I'll go and I'll explore that and I'll take the light and then I'll continue working it, and massaging it until what I thought I saw in my mind starts becoming and being revealed. Um, one of the things about being uh, dyslexic I've learned is that people think in different ways. They either are uh, visual thinkers where they see a, uh, a picture or they hear a voice in their head when they're thinking. Dyslexics do both, but then their pictures in 3D so you can move it around. And that's why you know, reversing those numbers and letters and everything becomes such an issue. So when I'll see things out of the side of my eye, I'll go back and I'll look for it, because I'll think, oh, that was really cool. I want to go back to that. And I go back there, and what I thought I saw isn't there. But with this light, I can come through, and I can start rebuilding that image that I saw in my mind so I can create that emotion again. And um, it's just a, a day of exploration and discovery. And it's, um, it's very fulfilling, and when the image is complete, I do have an iPad that comes up so I can get instant results as to what I'm doing. Um, there's just something that, there's a feeling that comes into my kind of chest area that just is like, okay, that's it, that's, that's what I'm looking for, and, it, and it's this satisfying um, response. That's beautiful. And isn't it interesting that each of these artists have a desire to help us slow down? I mean, you, you, it's all about slowing down and getting us to, to see the eye through their lens or see the world through their lens. And I, I think that's the definition of fine art photography is that which makes you slow down and look and become part of the image that you're looking at. Um, and you've all done that really well. And Carolyn, you have, um, I'd love to watch her her technique. She does macro images. So this one behind me and John and Carolyn, I just love. And you have a, an example of what you, oh, can you get it off the wall or can we pass it around? Um, so Carolyn finds beautiful things in nature, including once in a while she found a chewed up tennis, tennis ball or baseball or something that was a dog toy. But Go ahead and talk about your macro, how you set up, and how, how many exposures you get to, to manage this kind of photo. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's, it's all about, and I didn't really realize that in the beginning when I started my studio work, it was about slowing down and looking at all details in life or seeing beauty and just the smallest thing in the world, geez. And it's, 
It's, and I'm even surprised when I take the picture, when I see the subject, and then I see it on my computer, I'm able to, be able to, be able to able to trade microphones. Uh, so I'm able to uh, really see what I'm photographing. So the picture behind you is um, a blue wing teal, which is a duck, and it's the breast feather on the blue wing teal. So um, this image, I don't know exactly how many images I had to take to get this, but it was probably about 60 or 70. So I do something called focus stacking, which is taking pictures at incremental focal lengths, and then there's software that will merge together all the focus parts of each image to, into one image. So this, is, this picture is from about 70 images. And when I blew it up on the screen or zoomed in on my computer screen, I was just amazed at all the fine detail into this one frickin' feather. It's like, what is going, I mean, we all know feathers are complicated, but once you look at it that close and how they kind of start to lace together, they're all single little, I can't even, I don't even know what the right words, terms are, but they're all laced together with these finer little feathers. So it's just phenomenal. Um, and the reason I put a color behind this one was to really show that, to show how, um, to show the structure of the feather so you can see through it. Was the color, maybe I can yeah. Was the color there when you were shooting it or did you lay it? No, it was there when I shot it. Usually I will remove the background color, which is usually black or white. But this one, um, knowing that I was not going to go in there and remove all that space in between all the feather, all the little pieces, so I, I what I did was project a blue, blue light to the the wall behind it, and that's how I got that blue. And you'll use like little tiny clips to suspend whatever element you're. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll use all either crazy glue, uh, insect pins to things, um, or wires, or stick wires and cactus. I mean, I shoot all sorts of different things, not just feathers and mushrooms. But I have anything that strikes my fancy. I cheese it. Um, there is an extreme close-up of a cheese it in her studio. Yeah, I have a, I have a, a cheese it in there, which becomes an abstraction, which is kind of neat to see people trying to figure out what it is because it's. It's 30 inches wide, so um, that's that I like to, and I'm starting to explore the more abstract side of photography, and that's what this is about. And I have another group of feathers in my studio, which is an abstraction too. Some people, you know, they take some a minute to figure out what it is. And you have one of the most comprehensive books on mushrooms. Uh, her photography. Oh, here. Yeah. So those couple years where the mushrooms were really good in Maryland, I took. Uh, 97 portraits of mushrooms. So, and I put them into this little book, which you can buy on Amazon or here. So, anyway, it's called okay. 90, 97 Mushroom Portraits. Available in the uh, Celebration Fine Art gift shop or in Carolyn's yep. studio. But um, yeah, it's really fascinating. This having this blown up in the macro side, it looks like herringbone, like the texture. And and to imagine that nature has all that figured out like it's not it's not just a, a solid feather it's all these little tiny incremental pieces that go together to create the feather and it's pretty uh pretty majestic it is pretty and, and the salt crystals on a cheese it are pretty impressive too <laughs> yeah it's, i mean you really again let's see the world through their lens i love it i want to so, know did you eat it <laughs> okay well and, and her husband paul's favorite food is anything orange so yeah. Uh, Reese's, I mean, the packaging does, it can be orange, not this. Yeah, actually the packaging. Yeah, packaging, but Cheez-Its, Cheetos, all good. Um, I'm sure we're going to have more questions for you, Caroline, but, uh, so John, when you segued into your, your amazing spiritual capturing of the, the na natural world, you, you managed to get out into some of the remote places and find the shots, and um, you do mostly black and white now, yeah. although you have some color. Yeah. But talk about like how long does it take to capture that shot? 
I don't. I think you're going to be amazed when I tell you how long. Uh, and I, and Lighthunter mentioned this earlier. Um, you know this this notion of film and that causing or 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 perhaps pushing us in the direction where you have to wait. Well, the man that I showed my photographs to initially that encouraged me to show them to Susan and then uh, and then here I am all these years later. Uh, a master photographer who I had the great privilege to work with and at the same time the, the it, it was a very difficult uh, uh, task to work with this man because he was in his 80s he lived with film his whole life now he'd also transitioned into even at that age into, into using digital equipment but he had changed and, and this will be uh, and Carrie, you know that I can get long-winded, and I'll end up wandering back into answering Susan's question, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to kind of nail down this point. Uh, the man that taught me how to use a, a digital camera, he taught me in such a way that it was, um, sometimes uh, very trying. So I had phoned him on one occasion and, and said, if you could go anywhere, where would you like to go today? He said, Shiprock. And I said, that sounds great. Let's go to Shiprock. And he said, well, you know, I, I can't drive anymore. And I said, well, it's a good thing I've got a license. I'll come and pick you up. So I drove to Santa Fe. We went to Shiprock. It's, a, it's one of four holy mountains for the natives, uh, they believe Shiprock is a, a vessel that brought them to this world, so it is a very spiritual place. Um, this man owns a flip phone, and I didn't feel the necessity when I picked him up from Santa Fe to tell him that we could use, use a smartphone and we'd find our way there pretty quickly. I let him take us there by memory. And when we got there, he said, I'm gonna have you park your vehicle right here and then I want you to walk a mile towards that monument and I want you to sit there until the sun's gone and when you come back I'm going to look at your camera and I want to see more than four photographs. So in the age of being able to use a digital camera not having to worry about film exposure and only having so many pieces of film to work with that forces you to slow down, you can snap away with a digital camera with very little expense. And I'm sitting there wondering, you know, for a few, like, what is he trying to teach me? And then, and we had a discussion patience. with it. Yeah. And, and it was more than patience, Susan. It was, it was this notion that you can't make art happen. Either it's there or it's not there. And I sat there and I pondered about this. I was there until the sun went down. And that photograph isn't on the wall here. This photograph of the Grand Canyon is. But this canyon photograph is a byproduct of what I learned from him a number of years ago. So I waited a number of hours, and I waited softly for the light just to, to gently kiss the surface of ship rock, and I took four photographs to make certain I had one clean shot. Now, fast forward a number of years, I'm trying to take something to the Grand Canyon, and yes, I do drill down into black and white photography, and the reason that I do it, I'm not going to I'm, I'm not begrudging anything that anyone else does. I love all things art, from ceramics to jewelry to contemporary work to Western work, from, from cowboy to contemporary. I embrace it all. But in my view and why I stay in black and white is that if it weren't for black and white photography, I'm not so certain that photography would have been embraced in the fine art conversations. So it's people like, uh, uh, certainly, uh, Ansel Adams, uh, Weston, uh, Frank, you know, photographers like that that brought photography into the art world for us to enjoy. Um, taking photographs in black and white, it's my view that when you strip color out of a photograph, you're left with the truth. At least that's my truth. And in the situation with this Grand Canyon shot, that was seven years. And in using what Mr. Belcher taught me, there were days that I went to this spot in the canyon, and I sat there for hours, 
and didn't even take a photograph. And I'd go home. And I did that, I'd go twice a year, early summer, late summer, and this photograph was finally made just this last summer. So this idea that, that you know, we're slowing down, you know, the world does get fast. And, and photography is a discipline, and I can tell you the longer that I do it, the more respect I have for it as an art form and as a discipline, because it does, either you're inherently patient or you're going to learn patience. And, and what Mr. Belcher taught me is that you cannot make art happen. Now I could take 100 shots of this on any given day, and I could go through there and I could just put my finger on one and say, well that might work, but there's no soul. In it. There's no connectivity between me and that particular image. And for me, I think that's what life's about, it's about connection. That's what this show's about, it's about connection. And, and that's what I try to make my art about, it's about connection. Spectacular, thank you. And I appreciate what Mr. Belcher inspired in you. That's very good. Um, okay, I don't, I'm trying to figure out which direction to go. Do, do, do we want to talk a little bit about uh, specific techniques? Uh, Light Hunter, you print. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, Cibachrome. It's a very unique uh, type of printing material. They actually discontinued it since uh, 2012, I believe. I bought the last of the material and chemistry that I could get my hands on. Put a mortgage on my home and just bought as much material as I could because I'm a real big believer in Cibachrome. I started my first print in the uh, beginning of the 80s and uh, had a one bedroom apartment that uh, when I turned 18, when my mom did pass away, I'll go back to that for a minute, I got two checks from Social Security and uh, the first check was $450, I bought a camera. Second check, I bought a dark room for the same amount, $450 and I started pre printing Cibachrome. And why I decided to print Cibachrome actually has a lot to do with uh, Ansel Adams. Going back to John, uh, black and white is a wonderful way to learn how to see. Uh, I started in black and white, and uh, it really forces you to learn pre-visualization and uh, really understand that the dark room actually is a big part of the uh, photographic process of making images. And I saw an exhibit in Scottsdale, I think it was Scottsdale Center for the Arts when I was a teenager, and it blew my mind. It, it was really an impactful thing. It changed the way I thought about photography and, and thought about how I'm gonna approach uh, the medium. And I saw an exhibit of Ansel Adams' work, and I walked into a room about this size of all his classic images, and uh, like Moonrise or Hernandez, Yosemite, you know, there's a lot of beautiful images that he captured, of course, in black and white. And most of them are in the 30s and 40s that he captured. And I uh, walked into this room and I saw all these classic images in black and white. And the first room I walked into, I wasn't that impressed. And I know that sounds funny because this is Ansel Adams. And I was like, what's going on here? And then I walked into another room and it was the same images that he printed a decade later, and they looked better. It was really beautiful, I was like, wow. These are the same images, and yet they look like there's a little more life in them, a little more soul, like, like John expressed. And, and then there was a third room, all the same images, and I think I got cried, because they were just so beautiful. And yet they were the same negatives that he captured, and at that moment I realized, the dark room was a big part of the craft, and uh, so what am I going to do with photography to express that beauty? And I, I believe uh, Ansel Adams worked in black and white for a number of reasons. One of them, I believe, is it was the most archival medium back then because color would fade. And uh, but being in the early '80s, uh, Cibachrome is a very stable medium. It's the most stable color photographic process ever made. There's a lot of silver in the emulsion. And uh, I knew about Cibachrome back then. I didn't get online because there was no such thing. I didn't search YouTube. And, um, but I was determined to do color because when I see the Southwest and I see these incredible moments, I wanted to capture color and I wanted to use a medium that would last and wouldn't just fade away. And 
zebra chrome at the time was the, the material of choice. And uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna devote that kind of attention and discipline to the dark room using zebra chrome for color. And uh, that's why I decided to go ahead and use zebra chrome. And uh, I had a one bedroom apartment when I was 18 and, and uh, I turned it into a dark room. And it was pretty scary because I thought I was gonna get kicked out because I had, I had all this plumbing going from the bathroom into the bedroom and uh, had the, the windows uh, tinted out and they're probably thinking I was making drugs or something, but I was just making prints and, and uh, I was scared of, that they were gonna do a home inspection and I was gonna get kicked out, but it worked out. I made my first Cibacrome print and it was not easy, I'll tell you that. Um, I learned, I didn't have a teacher, I learned through trial and error. And I think there's a lot of value of that to learn from trial and error, but it's also a painful way to learn because you have to make a lot of mistakes and I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I kept my very first Cibacrome print that I made uh, in the early 80s and it was terrible, but I kept it <laughs> anyway. Um, very difficult medium. But Cibacrome, as you can see, there's a lot of silver and I like to mention that because when you go to my booth and you see the images, the first thing people say is, what? They look backlit. Is this printed on metal? What's going on here? And they just look, you know, they're glowing. And uh, I'll try to explain that, first off, it's film. Second, it's Cibachrome. And even though the image itself is very thin, the emulsion is very thin, there's 13 layers of silver that's captured within that emulsion of cyan, yellow, magenta, which makes up color. And uh, there's a lot of depth, so when you change the lighting on it, it lights up the, the image and, and has a lot of depth to it. And I just love that feeling because just like when I was a kid looking at those postcards, I would get lost in the image and feel its beauty and the spirit behind it. And I knew that medium was going to be really perfect. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting when I look back at things in a 40-year career, I've worked with one medium. And, uh, and I know most artists, you know, will try a variety of many different things and I uh, just stuck with one thing and tried to master it really well and keep pushing the envelope like Ansel Adams that, uh, you know, after every decade his work got better and better and better even though it was the same negative that he captured, his prints got more beautiful uh, as he got better in his uh, craftsmanship in the dark room. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna devote that same kind of attention to detail and color and contrast and density and all the things that makes an image. And, and I'm gonna be honest with you, there's no straight print, meaning um, I work really hard to make these images. Sometimes it takes three months to make one in the dark room. And uh, that's, not, that's not very common nowadays when you make a print, but that's the kind of attention and detail that I put into making each image. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the uh, satisfaction behind it is, is how can I make it even better? And I'm still looking for ways to make it better. And I still have some few little tricks up my sleeve of maybe what I can do next year that even make it that much better. But, um, but it is an exercise to keep pushing yourself to make something better and better. So hopefully that explains a little bit of the process, but it's called Cedar Chrome. And I do think it's the most beautiful color process I've ever witnessed. Bill, you recently received a pretty extraordinary award. Would you tell us all a little bit about that competition and how that came to be and what you won? Uh, sure. It's uh, called the Refocus Awards and it's an international award. There's 77 countries that were involved and there were several thousand entries. And so I entered in eight images to the competition. And subjects with automobiles has kind of had a very small niche market and it hasn't had necessarily a big wide appeal. But I just felt the way I was uh, working with my imagery, it was kind of going beyond that and it was getting into the area that the images were being appreciated for the emotion in them, the, the, the lighting, the composition. So I put them into the award, um, not knowing what to expect, and uh, the, the series of eight images won the uh, first place for the entire show, and then it won 
uh, gold in the fine art division, and it won gold in the uh, minimalism uh, edition. So that was that was pretty satisfying to see what I had in my mind and what I thought could uh, come from this was uh, was was coming to fruition. And I'm glad you brought up the the dark rooms. Um, when I was doing film, I absolutely loved being in the dark room. And as you were talking, I started realizing that my dark room now has reversed. Before it was after. I was had taken the exposure and then I would go in and I would dodge and burn and work on contrast and work on different elements to give the print different feels. But what I'm realizing now is that I do that while I'm photographing the cars or I'm painting with light. Because when I uh, take an image, it comes up on an iPad and I look at it and, I, and the same thing that I would do when I had print. Take away a little light here, add a little light here, bring in some more contrast. So the processes are kind of kind of mirror back to those uh, to those days in, in the in the dark room. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, and absolutely see how that works. Yeah, um, I know we're getting close to being out of time, and I'm certain that people have questions for this extraordinary panel. And I just want to say how proud I am to bring. Uh, fine art photography into the fine art world in such a great way with these uh, accomplished photographers. So thank you. And um, what what questions might we have out there? Yeah. Angeles, I had an exhibition there for the I Have a Name project, which was the photographs of people on the street, which incidentally a film was just made about uh, by the Bronfman family. And uh, when the exhibition of that work traveled to Los Angeles, uh, the gallery owner was also a photographer, and he was using the paper that you see here. Um, that's in this photograph. And you and I talked earlier before, uh, before this started this afternoon, and we were discussing um, the details. And I'm very fussy with, you know, with every detail. I think I, part of that was you know, years ago working with Mr. Warren, and, and he was fussy about buttons and fabrics and threads and colors. And you know, all these years later, you know, this is my final chapter in photography. And uh, but years of, of of having worked with him, um, I was left with being mindful of every every detail. And I'm fussy from the framing that I use to the matting that I use. Um, starts with the image, of course. Uh, but the paper that I'm using, and I can appreciate. You know everything that everyone up here is doing. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to be up here on this panel with, with all of these other photographers. But this man in Los Angeles was using this paper, and I hadn't seen it before. And, I, and you know, normally you're used to seeing things on, in some cases, on metal or or Chromalux or the film that Lifehunter is using. And then you know, I'm, I'm sure. You know, what kind of paper is this? Yeah. So it's, it's typically very shiny, the surfaces that you see uh, from a photographic standpoint. But Cielo Garcia was using the paper that, that you see behind me, and I asked him about it. And he said it was a paper that he imported from Europe, that it was cotton, rice, linen, bamboo, typically based, and that it had a matte finish, and that it was quiet. And I fell in love with the paper and I've been using it since. I mean, it's not easy paper to get. Uh, it's, it's pricey paper to, to, uh, uh, to secure. But my feeling is if you're gonna do something, do it well and do it right. 
and it, at least where it relates itself to this work, I think it makes it, um, I, I want the work to be inviting. I want it to be engaging and I want it to be welcoming. And when the work is quiet and not noisy, um, I think it, it allows you to come into the piece. Uh, at, at least that's, uh, that's my process. So this is, it's a matte finished paper, it's important for you. And the quiet matches your images. Yes, it does. Yeah, complements it. Can I share one more thing? Um, when I was 18 and when I made those prints, those Cibachrome photographs, I made a portfolio of uh, places throughout Arizona and the beauty of uh, uh, the scenics and nature. I made these prints and I went downtown Scottsdale and I went knocking on all the doors uh, of the galleries down there. And uh, it was very intimidating because I didn't speak well and I was scared to show my prints. And I went in the galleries and um, I would mention the word photography. And they would immediately shut down. They would immediately say, oh, photography. Oh, almost kind of like it's not an art. And it was really uh, very, it was a big letdown. And I went to the next gallery and I walked in and said, yeah, I have uh, some photography I'd like to show you. And, they said the same thing. Oh, photography? Uh, hmm, yeah. Um, you know, the art world's really slow right now. Nothing's really selling. Oh, okay. And I'd go to the next gallery, and I heard the same thing. And this was when I was 18. I didn't know really how to handle that. But it taught me something. And throughout that process, not one person took the time to look at my images. Not one person. And I was like, how can it not be an art form? And, and nature itself, I mean, is the greatest artist in my opinion. But how could you not take the time to witness that as an art? So I really want to thank you for bringing photography into the show as a celebration because it is an art form. And, you know, I know everyone here, you know, pours their heart into what they do. And uh, to be acknowledged as considered amongst other great artists here that uh, it is a, uh, an art form is really... Uh, really appreciate it. So I guess 40 years later, thank you, Susan, for bringing that here. Well, thank you. And I think we were all down on Main Street about the same, what year was that? Uh, probably about 83. Yeah, but we were all down there at that time, hanging out on Main Street. Um, and now we're elevating the fine art photography. Each, each year it gets better and better. We're probably part of that. Was there another question? Okay. I have a question. Is, is a picture ever better left untouched? Is, is, in, its, I, I, in, its, in its original form, its original taking, and just left the way it is? I think that's pretty rare. I think most images are manipulated. Yeah. I think most images are manipulated to the artist and how they want to see it because sometimes the equipment doesn't quite capture what you want it to capture. And a, you know, and a follow up with that as well, Carrie, um, and something that Lighthunter had mentioned earlier, I do own Moonrise over Hernandez that, that Ansel Adams took. And I saw at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, which is a mecca for photographers, and and those that love photography. Um, they had an exhibition there a few years back, and they showed what Ansel Adams had taken, you know, that was in the negative. And then, conversely, they show the finished product. And I can tell you that what I saw in the negative and then what I saw in the finished product were two, the, the negative was underwhelming. And the finished product was absolutely stunning. And I think personally that that is where the, the image is where the art starts. And, and what the photographer does in the finishing process is when the art happens. So. Yeah, good answer. We have one more quick question and then we'll wrap up. And I'm looking at nature right over there above the McDowell. It's pretty spectacular. Yeah. 
Uh, this is uh, directed to Bill Pack, and it's more of a quick request than a question. But Bill, would you quickly uh, tell the audience about the size of that photograph of the race car at the Indianapolis 500 Museum? I mean, I was blown away when you told me how much that's one film that's been enlarged to what size? Uh, so the Indianapolis 500, I was fortunate enough to do a, uh, be commissioned to do a book of their 34 winning cars in their private collection. And after the, um, the book came out, they had an exhibition room with, with my images, and um, they took the images up to the size, they were, they were 21 feet long. And uh, you could go up to them, and you could just read all the detail on the on the tires. It was just, it was quite amazing. That's cool. Just for perspective, isn't that 16 feet from beam to beam though? Yeah. So 16 feet add uh, five feet to that. Wow. Yeah. And it was about about 10 feet tall. Wow. wow. I want to go there now. See that. <laughs> but we could all get your book, or we could. You know, purchase that image if you still have it. So, um, wow, you guys, this is amazing, spectacular. Like I said, we could do an hour with each one, or we could go for hours. But we uh, try to wrap up according to our schedule. So, thank you all for being thank here, you. and thank you, Land Hunter, Bill, Carol, and John. Thanks for the people online. And uh, next. Friday is our final art discovery of the 2024 season. It's called The Long Haul, about the life of an artist and a little bit about the life of a celebration. So hope to have you join us and thank you so much.